to the Lubber's Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. You're with Ian. And with Mike. And we are reading our way through all of the Aubrey Matron novels of our favorite author, Patrick O'Brien. Mike, where did we get up to last week? And where might we be headed for this week? Oh, we're having a grand time. Ian, last week in Chapter 5, Stephen borrowed the ringle from a jealousy distressed Jack to take Padine, Clarissa, Bridget, and all of his gold to Spain. Bridget was fully out of her shell in the chapter. Love Sailing was loved by the crew. And unfortunately, due to the time they spent windbound in the downs, they had to skip their first two rendezvous points, and head for the Burlings to find Jack and the Bologna. Uh-huh. And this time in Chapter 5, we have to ask yourself, wait, what's that sound? Is that is that a great fleet action? Ah, well, we'll have to find out. We have friends helping friends, a master class in friendship, some questionable Plato, jealousy revealed and confronted, mm-hmm. and a pause for perspective. The ultimate distress of mind, so says Stephen. Ah, and in addition to this short and wonderful chapter, we have an interview with George Jepson and Brittany Stoner of Mick Books Press, publishers of a wide range of nautical fiction, including our recent guest, Seth Hunter, uh, a.k.a. Paul Breyers. George and Brittany have some great insights from the early days of best-selling writers like Alexander Kent, all the way up to today's nautical publishing scene. So great conversation. Yeah, really looking forward to that. So Mike, here we are at the beginning of chapter six, and let's be let's be straight about this right from the front. This is a fairly short chapter, but what it lacks in word count, it makes up for in a bit of emotional heft, I think. Let's see what we can find as we get into it. We remember that Stephen had only just managed to call back into the front of his mind where he was headed, which is these rocks called the Burlings. And the Ringle is now within sight of the Burlings. But as you mentioned, Mike, they hear the sound of what seems to be this big fleet engagement. Heavy, heavy cannon fire, thick smoke as they get closer. They clear for action and they're flying in to see if the Ringle can join battle. But getting closer and closer, the lookout mold sees that it's actually just the squadron. The squadron, larger than it was, they've had a couple of new vessels join, and they are busy at target practice, firing both sides of their ships. Now, we get this little exposition about how firing both sides is rare in battle, unless there's a general melee like there is in Trafalgar, and even rarer in practice because of the enormous powder expense that has to come out of the captain's pocket, in this case, the Commodore's pocket. Now, Jack as we all know, had already had the chance to learn the disastrous effect, it says in the text, of not training the crew to fight both sides when the Java had missed the opportunity to rake the USS Constitution way back in the early months of the War of 1812, to rake the USS Constitution with her larboard guns whilst fighting the starboard guns. And having missed out on that chance, the Java in both the O'Brien world and in the real world, had been taken and destroyed by the Constitution. And Jack and many others had been taken prisoner. And that led to the events that we all remember in the fortune of war. Jack, however, also knows that some of his captains, like the spit and polish Captain Thomas, don't share his belief. They don't share the belief that no amount of courage would beat an enemy of roughly equal force who had the weather gauge and could fire faster and more accurately. So it sounds like Jack is setting out to win pretty early on this argument about courage and and flash esprit de corps versus gunnery and seamanship. And the Ringle approaches the Bologna side and, and Stevens, who's watching the Stately and the Thames and the Aurora's captain's barges, who, you know, who are all sitting there, is concerned that he's never going to be able to come aboard the ship in an undisgraced manner, given the large swell that's going on in the midst of all this firing. And as the ringle hooks on, Reed calls out for a stout whip, and he emphasizes stout. You know, he says, for the doctor's dunnage. But once it's made fast, he tells Stephen to sit on his sea chest and hold the rope with both hands. Now, the crew then sets Stephen and his chest down on the blowner's deck with what the text says was no more bump than would have cracked an egg. And I think Stephen very gratefully thanks the crew and then tugs on one of the crew member, Kaylee's left ear, which Stephen had sewn on, saying that Kaylee is as healthy as a young dog. And 
And I, I just loved how carefully Reed is looking after his friend, Stephen. Without a word to Stephen or anybody else about Stephen's predicament, he just does what's necessary to help him save face all the way around. And I think, let's stick a pin in that. It's a beautiful example of how old friends like Reed and Kaylee and Stephen help one another. Yes. And I also like the reminder of the difference between the youngsters like Reed and Kaylee, who are young and resilient and heal quickly. The contrast between them and Stephen, and in particular, Jack, who are getting older. And we're going to hear something in this chapter about how the passage of time is not serving Jack well, emotionally as well as physically. Yeah. Yeah. Anyhow, just like in the last chapter, one of the scenes that we get is this, an encounter with Captain Thomas coming away from an encounter with Jack Aubrey. This time he's coming out of the cabin, face pale with fury. Stephen comes up to him and he's piped straight over the side, takes no notice of the ceremony, unlike Duff of the Stately and Howard of the Aurora, who'd gone over in, in better mood and in better shape just a little while earlier. Captain Pullings greets Stephen, tells him to come and see the captain, ah, that is to say the Commodore, and meanwhile, chooses to name his second lieutenant, Harding, pointing out that the first lieutenant, whose name is Gray, is on the sick list. So we'll come back to Gray's predicament later on. Walking back to the cabin, Stephen compliments Tom on just how much the post-captain's uniform becomes him. And I think, Mike, I, I'm with Stephen. I still can't quite get it straight in my head that Tom Pullings has been made post, but he hasn't. It's great. Yeah. I I think even Tom can't quite get it straight in his head. Yeah. <laughs> he is absolutely loving it. That's for sure. Well, Stephen walks into the cabin all smiles, but he notices probably in the reflection in the, in the back glass that Jack looks so unhappy. He's got his arms out over his desk. He's looking so stern. And O'Brien tells us that Stephen's smile just fades. Stephen coughs to let him know he's there. Jack whips around <laughs> strong displeasure, masking his unhappiness. But then he jumps up. It says, like a young man, and he seizes Stephen with even more than his usual force, crying, God's my life, Stephen. How glad I am to see you. How is everything at home? Jack calls for Killick and a pot of coffee and a cot to be shipped for the doctor. And, you know, Killick replies that he's already been doing that. But the text says this, but in a more subdued tone of grievance than usual and not without an apprehensive look. And I, I couldn't help but, you know, kind of caught up and go, oh, whoa, whoa. What's up with Killick? It's a little unusual for him to be subdued around Stephen and Jack when all is well. Maybe another clue like Jack's expression that all is not well. Well, let's see what the chapter brings us. Meanwhile, Jack asks Stephen to give a little account of his journey. And Stephen says, well, the crew of the Ringle behaved in this very exemplary manner. He goes on about the speed that they made, but then very rapidly goes down a bit of a Stephen rabbit hole here. He recites his long litany of all the birds and fishes and seagoing creatures and vegetation that he had seen on the passage south of the Burlings until he sees Jack's attention slackening. And quickly gets to the point of recounting how he'd heard the great guns roaring with Reed doing everything he could not to miss the battle. And Stephen then asks Jack if this particular great gun exercise had been satisfactory. And Jack describes it as a bloody shambles, which is a very unusual but vehement thing for, for Jack to say about this kind of exercise. A bloody shambles, he says, but he hopes they'll do better another time. Have you, he says to Stephen, brought any letters from Ashgrove? And Mike, there's, there's something not right here. But besides Killig being subdued, Jack completely waves off a discussion about the potential root causes of a slightly dissatisfactory great gun exercise and asks about the mail. Right. Something here is not quite right. Well, Stephen apologizes for being disappointing, but says they didn't have time to stop. And Clarissa and Sophie are not friends. And Jack says, yeah, he, he knows that they're not. Jack says he had a recent letter from Ashgrove and says, I wouldn't say that it made me uneasy. And Stephen thinks to himself, well, the only time he's seen Jack this destroyed was when he was struck off the Navy list. And then Tom walks in with the results of the great gun exercise saying, you know, you're not going to be pleased. And Jack says, yeah, well, they're not pleasing. And he asks Stephen <laughs> if he'd like to come up and watch, you know, watch a ship firing both sides at targets. And he says, I, I don't think you've seen this before, Stephen. And Stephen says, you know, no, I haven't. I should like it of all things, says Stephen. Now then, again, something is not right here. 
the, these two are sort of dancing around some kind of a subject here. This, mm, well, let's, let's get into this conversation here. Let's see what's going to happen. Up on deck, the exercise is not over yet because we've seen how all the other ships in the squadron have performed. We haven't yet seen how the Bellona is going to perform. On deck, they beat to quarters, and Jack tells Stephen that it's only the main batteries on the gun deck and also the upper deck 32-pounders firing, which is already a heck of a lot of weight of metal and a heck of a lot of gunpowder. Everyone in the squadron knows that this final part of the exercise is supposed to be an example of how things are done, and that hopefully means that the crew of the Bellona are going to be working to please the Commodore and avoid his displeasure. Somebody else besides Killick, who's noticed that the Commodore is in a fairly stern mood. They've been working since early morning to have everything just right with the setup of the gun crews and their their equipment and their workplaces. And even though they have more than 500 people aboard the Bellona, that's still not enough to fight both sides. So a single gun crew needs to move backwards and forwards from port to starboard and serve two guns on opposite sides of the ships. They've practiced this often and they should have been confident, especially with all these surprises, men and old hands here aboard, but they're not. And Mike, this is another little tell that all is not on an even keel because normally Jack's gun crews can't wait to show their, their skills in a great gun contest. And surely they've got a great chance of beating all the others. But this time, even with all the preparation, there's a bit of a want of confidence here. Yeah, yeah. Some definite trepidation going on here. Sure. Well, Captain Pullings gives the word, targets are loosed, and they're coming by opposite sides of the ship at two-minute intervals. Jack starts his stopwatch. There's uh, some cheering as the first target is hit in the midst of this mighty roar of cannons firing fore to aft. But the gun deck's bow 32-pounder crew has no time to cheer. They reload, run out their guns, and race across the larboard where the second captain has the gun ready to point. The text says the shattering din, the billowing smoke had already confused Stephen's spirits and the perception when the, all of a sudden this uproar redoubles and the larboard guns come into play as the next set of targets move into range. Through all the overwhelming noise and intense labor, Stephen watches the gun crew shooting, heaving, leaping, running, never getting in each other's way, never stumbling, barely any words, only gestures and nods all immediately understood. Hmm. So, my, this is strangely a very, very intense and immediate description of gunfire. We've had the sort of the the series of moves and the description of the the moving in and out and the wadding and the reaming and the swabbing and stuff, but we've never had it explained in quite this state of nervous tension before. I'm I'm quite kind of on edge here. As I'm reading this, I'm wondering if it's all going to go okay. Well, eventually the din stops. And Jack says, well, it's not quite the equivalent of three broadsides in five minutes, but it's close and they'll soon work up to their target. Jack says to Stephen, what did you think of it? Well, he says, I had no idea it would be so strenuous, so skilled and dangerous. Yeah, way with you, Stephen. <laughs> it passes, he says, it passes all imagination. Can't imagine what it's like on the gunned deck below and Jack, in his very matter-of-fact tone, says, well, yes, very much like hell itself. However, he says, use makes master, which is another way of saying practice makes perfect. And he says, it's wonderful what people can grow accustomed to. Not many people, he says, in contrast, could stand Stephen's sores and buckets of blood. And speaking of which, uh, what, what was that old tradition they say in naming calls? When if you name something bad, it's, uh, right, it comes right. to your side. There's the senior assistant surgeon coming up to Stephen to report that they're concerned about the first lieutenant, Lieutenant Gray, and his condition, which he says is a sudden and acute attack of the stone. So he's got something akin to a kidney or gallbladder stone, and I'm pretty sure it's actually a stone that's now in the urinary bladder. I think that's the procedure that we're going to hear described later on. Super painful kidney stone that's passed into the bladder. And Stephen goes to examine Gray, who is in extreme, extreme unremitting pain, measures out a very large dose of laudanum and tells his assistant to have the carpenter prepare the necessary chair for surgery, if the patient should survive that long, in the morning. And it's funny, Mike, Stephen uh, refers to what he calls a measured drawing in Archbold and 
we believe that Stephen might hear, or at least O'Brien in Stephen's name, might have confused a medical manual with Archbold's manual, which is a standard work on English criminal law, which exists to this day. So th- thank you to Anthony Gary Brown in the Patrick O'Brien Muster book for spotting that. Anyhow, the wooden chair is all specified here to be made and put ready so that this cutting for the stone procedure can take place the following day. Nah. Well, returning to deck, a passing Killick tells Stephen that there'll be, in his words, a rare old duck for supper tonight. Now, Killick is on the way to an appointment with Bondin for a private word in the foretop where they won't be overheard. Yeah. And, and O'Brien tells it that these two really good friends hadn't talked since Bondin returned to the ship. You know, they hadn't exchanged a, but a couple words here. And Bondin asks Killick what's come over the barky. He says that when he left, she seemed to be a happy ship. And now it's as if old Nick or old Jarvie, that is the devil, or Admiral Lord St. Vincent were aboard here. And Killick says, well, it's not just the Purple Emperor and his discontented ship, which couldn't defeat a Yankee brig if it found one, or in Killick's word, that old stately with their parcel of puffs, though those add to it, Killick says, it's domestic infelicity. And wow. <laughs> he keeps repeating this domestic infelicity. And I remember, I think I was wondering, Killick, what do you mean by that? Well, uh, Bondon has the same question on his mind. We'll, we'll hear what he says in a second. But Mike, talk us through old Nick and old Jarvi. What might we be thinking about there? Yeah, well, old, old Nick, another name for the devil, which, you know, I think is probably pretty common your side of the pond yeah. here. And, and I was wondering, I thought, well, you know, I, I think I've heard that referred to in some other nautical books, but not so much over here generally. Turns out that Nick is from uh, Nick, and I K, a a Scandinavian name for an evil spirit associated with water. So very inappropriate devil-like reference on the water there. And yeah. old Jarvie, Admiral Lord St. Vincent, who we've met before in the canon, Sir John Jarvis, a British admiral famous for his temper, among other things, as well as his defeat of the French on HMS Victory at the Battle of Cape St. Vincent, where he got his peerage name, yeah. and his young uh, protege. God, what was that guy's name? Horatio Horatio Nelson, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah him. <laughs> Whatever happened to him? <laughs> yeah. And, and one day we'll get Kate Jamerson to come on and tell us about Horatio. So if you know Kate, please remind her. We'd Yay. love to hear from her. Come on, Kate. Come on. Very good. Now, we have this question hanging over us. What what kind of domestic infelicity are we talking about here? And Killick says, the, captain, uh, the Commodore and Mrs. A have parted brass rags. Now, this is, uh, I, I don't know if it's a specifically very British English phrase, but it's a phrase that is in pretty common usage to mean parted ways. You know, the friendship has, has broken down. I would use it to describe the end of either a romantic relationship or a platonic relationship. And not necessarily irrevocable, but like, mm, there's been a big breakdown in the relationship here. And this idea of parting brass rags originates among sailors, sailors who are friends, who, who you might have said were tie mates, two mates close together in a, in a ship's company, would quite often share a collection of personal gear, including cleaning gear, like rags in some kind of a shared bag. And when the friendship parts, when the two men's connection breaks down, so the rags in the bag are shared out. Partnering brass rags means not friends anymore. Now, Bondon understands the phrase perfectly, and he's really taken aback and says, well, Killick, how come you know this? And we get this explanation from Killick. And, and by the way, Mike, this is a, a, now a big part of reported action. We have lots of reported action in the books, but we don't very often get reported action shared in conversation between Killick and Bondon. And I think it's very significant that it's these two men who know Aubrey really, really well, who are the ones who are acting as the, the Greek chorus for us here. Killick explains that before they left on their last long journey, their long, very, very long journey around the world to Botany Bay and back, at that time, the captain had promised one of his tenants who was worried about his sons that he, Jack, would look after the youngsters, the sons of this tenant, if something happened to the father, because the family stood otherwise to, to lose their lease. The father had died. Mrs. Aubrey, going against this presumed wish of Jack's, 
had given one of the least properties to the eldest son and another to his nephew or godson, leaving the youngest son with no least property. And Bond notes in kind of mitigation here that the younger son was known to be an idle drunk who knew nothing about farming, but did have a pretty daughter. Now, on return, apparently, we learn that Captain Aubrey had been upset with this. He had meant for both sons to get the leases, not one son and the nephew. The younger son's daughter, who had a who was a maid at Ashgrove, was going to marry Ned, an old shipmate of theirs who had lost a foot and who was working at Ashgrove as a gardener. So there's this whole little set of domestic relationships here. And it turns out, beyond all of this, that Parson Hinksy, the man who used to court Sophie, had often been over to Ashgrove while they were at sea. Well liked, it turned out, by, by Mrs. Williams and her Thai mate, who had sat in the captain's particular chair and who had advised on this different distribution of the leases among the different members of this family. And in the report here from Killick, the captain, Mrs. Aubrey, had had words about Parson Hinksy calling so often. And Mike, we, we've had Hinksy's role in this situation trailed a bit for us here. Not only in the last few chapters have we heard of the name Hinksy, but actually we heard a fair bit about him way back in HMS Surprise. But if you've been searching for it in your Kindles, dear readers, you might have spotted that back in HMS Surprise, he had a C in his name, and now he has just a plain old K. So that's our Hinksy. And that's not the end of the story, is it, Mike? No, no, there's not. So Jack wanting to look after this old shipmate who'd lost a foot, the daughter was going to marry the younger son's thing. He was a little upset about this. Well, Killick says when Mrs. A goes to Barham, up where Mrs. Oaks look after the poor doctor's little natural, the text yeah. says. So this is the story's deepening. But Bonded's like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. He doesn't like this characterization of Bridget. Natural in you know, the Oxford English Dictionary is an archaic word meaning a person with an intellectual disability. And so Bonded yeah. says, no, whoa, whoa, hold on a minute. We've just run Mrs. Oates and Bridget over to the groin. And as the text says, she ain't a natural. She's as pretty a little maid as ever I see, talks away to Padine in their language, quite like a Christian to us, laughs when the barky ships a sea, goes aloft on old bold shoulders, never seasick, loves the sea. So in Bond's eyes, you know, there's no better daughter ever in the world. And he starts to explain how happy the doctor is with her, but Killix just continues on. He says, well, Mrs. A came back, that is, came back from visiting uh, Mrs. Oaks, tore off her scarlet gown. He says, you remember, made of the material that Bonden and Killick had used to make Mrs. Oaks' wedding dress and gave it to her maid. And Bonden remembers this. He remembers sewing her bodice. When the captain came back, the two had words, Mrs. A seeing too much of Parson Hinksy and thinking more of his advice than her husband's. And, as the text says, she went for him like a tartar, right savage, calling out that if he could use her so and accuse her so, while she was wearing his troll's leavings and being civil to her, she would be damned if she had anything more to do with him. And she took off her ring and Killick embellishes and then says, no, 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 never mind that, and finishes, tossed it out the window. And this, this troll, uh, an old word for a prostitute. So, you know, calling Mrs. Oaks, Aubrey's prostitute. And interestingly, you know, the text uh, says that, according to the maid, Sophie never cried, never said a foul word, never broke things, but that she had so much spirit and fury that she dragged him up and down and he slept in the summer house the last few days while she was behind the locked door of her dressing room. Kelly continues, there's no fond farewell either. Only the kids saw the captain off. And then a ship's boy interrupts them saying, the Commodore's cook says the duck will spoil if it isn't taken up right away. Man. Yeah. Besides all of the the tragedy and the heartbreak that lies behind this report, the story here, part of me is rooting for Sophie. Like that she had the composure to do this all without losing emotional control and without kind of using any kind of bad language towards Jack. She has just laid it out for him and he has no defense. And hence he's in the summer house. So Sophie, we hope it all gets fixed, but you go, girl. Yeah, I'm I'm with you. She is coming into her own. I love that. We talk so often about agency in this patriarchy. Yeah, Sophie's there. 
Well, my, I mean, the the Jack and Sophie relationship is one of the foundations of the whole canon, and it's a terrible, terrible moment that this relationship has hit this terrible disaster. And we could really dwell on it, but this is Patrick O'Brien. So we get some light relief with some dinner. <laughs> and we join not only Jack and Stephen at dinner, but also Killick and some duck. This duck that was going to gonna spoil. Killick, said the Commodore, passing him an empty gravy boat. Tell my cook to fill this with something that very closely resembles gravy or take the consequences. Heaven and earth alike revolt against a parched and withered duck, he added, addressing Stephen. If a duck lack unction, it forfeits all right to the name, said Stephen. I'm like, this is one of those funny phrases, besides being humorous. If a duck lack unction, it forfeit all right to the name. It's one of those phrases that I often play back to myself. I just like this particular turn of phrase. And I like the fact, as I look into it, that it's a clever play on words. And as somebody who was raised a Catholic, I remember the word unction being dropped in from time to time in my spiritual education. Heaven and earth alike revolt against a parched duck, we learn. And if, if a sermon has unction, so they would say in, uh, in certain parts of the church, if a sermon has unction, then the Holy Spirit is in it. And we might almost be saying, Jack, if a preacher lack unction, they forfeit all right to the name. And yet... Actually, there's there's another obscure word connection here. The word unctuous, besides meaning flattering or ingratiating, also means oily. So if a bird lack any kind of oily texture, it's hard to get down. So we've got this combination of spiritual unction and the, the unctuousness of, of Greece. And fortunately, Stephen, with his surgeon skills, has found some aiguillettes, these long, thin slices of meat cut lengthwise from under the breast of the duck that are a bit more tender and a bit more juicy and they can get those down without needing the gravy. And Mike, an, another name for an aiguillette with another connection, another play on words meanings here is that an aiguillette is an ornament on some military and naval uniforms. Those braids of gold lace that hang down from the shoulder and often worn on uniforms and the, 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 the braids end in points. Worn there right across the breast, just like the duck's breast we were talking about. Yeah. Yeah. O'Brien's got us from, from Stephen's little critique of Jack's sermon about ducks all the way to aiguillettes. It's it's a phenomenal, multiple, multiple play on words here all the way around in that little conversation, that funny conversation between the two of them. Yeah, and uh, St- Stephen gets on with the carving and he's uh, he's admired on all hands, right? Well, it's so funny because, you know, we just had this with Duff and Thomas earlier in the book, you know. Jack says, oh, I wish I could carve like that. Well, we we just heard that too, right? Jack says, his carved birds usually fly off spreading fat all over the table and the laps of the guests. And, and we all remember that and keep our nanking trousers covered accordingly when Jack's carving. <laughs> but Stephen says, the only vessel he ever sailed turned ignominiously upside down. So each man to his own trade, said Plato, that's justice. <laughs> okay. Okay. Very good. I like that. That seems to echo a little bit of Jack's, you know, use makes master comment from earlier in the chapter. And then Jack encourages Stephen to eat and drink some more, but Stephen says he has a very busy day and he really has to be rather Spartan at this meal because of the morning that he's expecting here. Right. Then Stephen goes on and we're kind of this conversation is just, it's just like you said, it's a short chapter in, but it's so rich. It's so well packed. And, and this is, boy, I want to tell everybody, pay attention, watch. <laughs> well, we pick up on another of the observations of Plato. And it is a, it's a beautiful quote to begin with. Calligraphy, he's thinking, is the physical manifestation of an architecture of the soul. And he's using this as a way of introducing a whole series of compliments that he's going to pay to the to the absent Parson Hinksy. But this this quote here, hmm, we, we believe that it might be Plato. What do our experts really say about this, Mike? Well, when Jack says it's Plato, but our consulting Latin Karen says that, no, 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 no. She searched all of Plato's collective works, could not find this quote or anything that could be construed to be like it. And Karen writes... It seems a most unplatonic sentiment, given that Plato disapproved of artistic productions and was hesitant about writing and specifically cautioned against spending time on fancy writing. So, you know, I would say thanks, Karen. Now, 
I would say, however, that I wouldn't be at all surprised to find this in Muslim scriptural writings or somewhere because calligraphy was kind of the architecture of the soul there. And so it wasn't art there, but perhaps not Plato. But Stephen picks up on this and then uses it, like you say, for an interesting degradation of himself and compliment of Jack. Yeah. He says that he, Stephen, must have a turf and wattle soul. And turf and wattle is a building construction technique, taking a wood frame and packing it with clay and soil and animal dung and straw. Because, he says, his own handwriting, Stephen's handwriting, would be disowned by a backward cat, while Jack's soul, given his elegant handwriting, especially on charts, must be one that might have conceived the Parthenon, the Greek temple up on the hill in Athens there. And Jack bows without saying anything at this very deft compliment. And Stephen, well, well, we'll see what kind of agenda he might have in the conversation here, but it begins to direct compliments in turn to Parson Hengsey. He says that Hengsey had quoted the saying when Stephen had dined with him in London, which we noticed earlier on. We also, by the way, had stuck a pin in this chapter in Reed's way of helping a friend, helping the doctor get aboard. Now he's slipping in a little bit of help for Jack. And it all begins with this casual compliment for Jack's handwriting and subtly opening the door for the conversation to shift towards the subject of Hinksy. Now, Spotted Dog, which as we all know is probably Jack's favourite pudding, comes in, but Jack hasn't really got the appetite for it. He eats mechanically, he pushes the plate away, and Killick brings in the port. Jack tells Killick to go turn in, locks the coach and the sleeping cabin doors, leaving the shocked Killick on the other side, asking, what, no coffee? Because this conversation is about to get very personal and very private. Returning to Stephen, Jack says, in this kind of rather cold, bald way, I didn't know you dined with Hinksy," And then asks Stephen what he thought of him. Stephen says, well, I ran into him. I was looking at sheet music. I found him uh, a knowing and conversant person. So talking on the subject of Old Bach, who Jack is a fan of. And Stephen had invited Hinksy to dine at Black's, where they'd had a good dinner. They talked about the Benders. We'll come to Bender in a second. And Stephen suggested that maybe he and Jack could play some of the Bender duets after their wine. And Jack says, he has no more heart for music than he has for food. He hasn't touched his fiddle since they put to sea, which is a really, really grave moment. He asks Stephen to say a bit more about Hinksy. This conversation's far from over yet. But let, let me just dip into Bender for a second, if I may, Mike, because this is a, a, little, a little musical pointer here. First of all, when I read this reference, I, I don't know anything about the Bender brothers, these two composers. Um, I didn't know very much about them until I looked them up because they are referred to in the O'Brien books. The Bender brothers, Franz and Georg, were composers very much in the classical style in Bohemia, which is in the modern day known as the Czech Republic, back in the late 18th century. There was a whole extended family of Benders, performers and composers, male and female. They were pretty obscure And I think that maybe this is one of the slightly snobbish reasons why O'Brien liked to refer to them, because nobody else has heard of them. There is an interesting link to the 20th century here. For those of you who can remember the early days of the Apple Computer Corporation, Apple premiered a video of a tool that they called Knowledge Navigator as a conceptual idea. Uh, They presented it in a keynote speech by John Scully a name to conjure with if you remember the early days of Apple. And it had demonstrations of multimedia and linked hypertext and interactive learning, kind of a precursor to the way that we use internet browsers now. And it featured Georg Bender's harpsichord concerto in C. So if you can remember all that way back, you might recall a piece of music, certainly a reference there for the diehard Apple scholars, Mike. Although I suspect O'Brien wasn't an Apple kind of a guy. I think he would have been a Unix man if he was anything. (laughs) that's well spotted uh well you know since jack asked him to say a bit more steven says yeah well hinksy was really good company he's a scholar he's a gentleman he was certainly very kind to sophie while they were gone And, and jack says he knows he was obliged to him and then he mutters that he hopes he doesn't have to thank him for a set of horns wow steven ignores the mutter and Recalls, you know, that he had seen a cricket game once. There was a great catch. Someone had asked who'd caught it. And a woman replied, it was the handsome gentleman, Mr. Hinksy. 
And Jack replies, handsome is as handsome does. I can't imagine what they see in him. And Stephen says, well, Hingsey seems to be admirably adapted to please a young woman or a woman of a certain age. And we can almost say, you know, Stephen's kind of opening the wound, dumping a little salt in here. It's the, and Jack continues, you know, I can't imagine what they see in him. And Stephen replies, well, perhaps your imagination runs on different wheels, my dear. However that may be, it appears that Miss Smith, Miss Lucy Smith, sees so much that she has accepted his offer of marriage. Ha. And, you know, I, I think Jack might say, Stephen, you're buried the lead on this story, man. Hey, <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. But I think Stephen is trying to do more than simply, if you will, let his friend off the anxiety hook. You know, given their earlier conversation about adultery and Jack, you know, I'd be the second, but, you know, adultery is all. And his love for Jack, his love for Sophie. I think he's trying to help both of them. And he really wanted Jack kind of in here and committed before he gave the reveal on Hinksy. Yeah, really, really sensitive, deft use of the conversation there by Stephen. And we're going to, we start to breathe a bit of a sigh of relief. I was thinking, you know, Jack's going to go off on one. He's going to say all these bad things about Sophie, or he's going to express his displeasure in a way that he can't row back from. But Stephen has judged and timed what he says and how he listens as well perfectly. And Stephen kind of puts a bit more gloss on this. He says that Hinksy had told him the news with modest triumph. So Hinksy's genuinely pleased to have got the hand in marriage of young Miss Smith and to have this great role in the in the colonial church. Miss Smith's father, a great man at the East India Company, so approves of the match that he's used all his influence to have Mr. Hinksy appointed bishop, Anglican bishop, of course, of a major Indian city. Stephen isn't certain which, given all the toasts that the two men had drunk after the announcement. And in a bit of a non sequitur here, Stephen says, well, Jack, are we still in the right region for beer? To begin with, Jack goes right past this beer question. And he's just overwhelmed with happiness to begin with at the news. He says, I can't tell you how glad I am that you told me that Hinksy is going to be married. He says, I've been on the point of unbosoming myself, sharing foolish, discreditable thoughts with Stephen. And my mood goes right up here. Jack has, you know, managed to learn this great piece of insight and he believes it importantly. And I think he's on the way to being able to use this to change a little bit now about the situation between him and Sophie. And he's so happy. He finally gets around to remembering Stephen's beer question. And Stephen wonders once again, are we still close enough to home that they're serving out beer instead of grog? And Jack says, yes, we are. And Stephen says he'd like some because good ship's beer is, in his phrase, the most virtuous hypnotic known to man. And he needs a light, gentle sleep tonight. So Jack and Stephen share a quart of beer and they're, you know, they're doing it in this shipment way. They're, they're passing it back and forth and they're watching this long running wake in the moonlight. And Jack says, but you know, I made no direct accusations. Jack is protesting that he never directly accused Sophie of adultery. Brother, said Stephen, for the text, you can give a woman a great wounding kick on the bottom and then assert you never slapped her face. It's a good line. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Jack says, Sophie should never have said you're troll. Jack claims that he was perfectly innocent in this case. And Stephen responds in the text says, in that case, on how many others were you not as guilty as ever your feeble powers would allow? For shame to quibble so. It was unfortunate, but it gives you no moral height at all. None whatsoever. Your only course is to crawl flat on your belly, roaring out pakavi and beating your bosom. What's this pakavi thing all about then? <laughs> yeah, so this is, this is simply Latin for I have sinned. I oh. have sinned. So it's another, you know, you need to go throw yourself upon her mercy, scream mea culpa, and, and give it up, Jack. Yeah, it, it, it's great advice. It's the only advice, really. You're right. And I'm, 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 again, I'm really happy for Stephen that he's managed to give this. So th th there have been plenty of times in the past where Stephen has had to skirt around giving direct advice, but I'm so glad that he can get straight to the heart of the matter here. And he goes on to say that they are both he says, deeply afflicted with what he calls the accursed blemish of jealousy, this flaw that sours life within and without. And he says to Jack, if you don't heave your wind, meaning if you don't get a move on and fix this, you will be hopelessly undone. And, and Jack has a, one brief attempt at defending his own position. 
I have always prided myself, he says, on a perfect freedom from jealousy. And I, I love this rejoinder from Stephen. For a great while, says Stephen, I prided myself on my transcendent beauty on much the same grounds, or even better. <laughs> so I, I love the humor. I love the, uh, the the back and forth between them. But it's also like, really great that Stephen is helping his friend. He's intervening in this situation. He's providing at least the possibility that Jack and Sophie can repair things going forward. And how he does it is so deft and so gentle. He said that he could not be the good friend saving the day with a few well-chosen words, but I think he's done exactly that. And uh, it's great the way he's done it. Now, S Stephen's wisdom has more to offer us still in this chapter, though, before we finish, right, Mike? It does. It does. So the text says, they finish their beer, and presently, Stephen, coming back into the cabin from the quarter gallery, said, but I'm glad you did not open your mind. Later, you would have held it against me. Mm. And in any case, I could not have given you the sympathy that you would have felt your right. In the morning, I must almost certainly cut a man for the stone and marital discord, above all that which is based on misapprehensions, seems trifling in comparison with undergoing a lithotomy at sea and a probable death in extreme apprehension in human suffering and distress of mind, Ooh. the ultimate distress of mind. End of chapter six. Wow, Ooh. Mike. Well, as we said, uh, a short chapter, but one with lots and lots to talk about. Before we get to talking about the chapter, let's take a few moments now to listen in on a conversation that you and I had with our friends George Jepson and Brittany Stoner from Muck Books Press to hear a little bit about the world of publishing and nautical fiction. So we're joined today by George Jepson and Brittany Stoner from Muck Books Press, which is an imprint of Globe Pequot, of the trade division of the publishing house Roman and Littlefield. Muck Books Press specializes in nautical fiction titles and carries authors that you might know the names of, including Dudley Pope, Dewey Lambdin, Julian Stockwin, David Donachy, Alexander Kent, also known as Douglas Riemann, C. Northcott Parkinson, and Richard Woodman. And of course, our former show guest recently, Seth Hunter, also known as Paul Breyer's author of Trafalgar Fog of War. So Brittany, George, thanks very much for joining us on The Lubber's Hole. Thank you. We're thrilled to be here. Yep. George, can you tell us a little bit about McBooks and how it came into an existence as, as a publisher of our favorite genre, nautical fiction? Well, McBooks Press dates back to the early 1980s in Ithaca, New York, where a fellow by the name of uh, Alexander Scutt ran a bookstore called McBooks. Mm -hmm. And uh, along the line, uh, toward the end of the 80s, uh, he moved into uh, publishing. And he focused on uh, nautical fiction at that time. Uh, in those days, there, there was no Amazon or right. on online book selling. And so it was very difficult in the United States to find books by people like Alexander Kent, um, the, the Blytho series, which was very popular uh, among uh, readers in those days. So Alex stuck out uh, and uh, uh, contacted uh, Douglas Riemann mm -hmm. and uh, ended up publishing uh, the Alexander Kent series totally. And from there, he moved on into uh, other authors at that point. But that, it really started to uh, uh, pick up steam in about the uh, uh, late 1990s. Wow, which, of course, was, was peak O'Brien time as well. It sounds like it was a big time in the, uh, in the genre. It was. And um, at that time, readers across the, the world, basically uh, the UK, the United States, Canada, were really into the, the whole genre. My experience in those days was that there was uh, uh, an interest in all the authors. Right. And then along, mm. came, along came Patrick O'Brien, who was uh, on a different level uh, from a literary standpoint. But in general, people read just about everyone in those days. Yeah. So everybody's picked up and got at least a couple of Alexander Kent and C.S. Forrester and Julius Stockwin and all the others. Yeah. Right. And tell us about how you came to be involved. What was the uh, what was the origin of your your interest in this in this world, George? Well, it all started out with uh, Alexander Kent back in the nineteen uh, seventies. Uh, I had read the uh, uh, Hornblower series, but 
there was nothing else much out there. And I went to a little local independent bookshop one day and picked up uh, a couple of paperbacks by Kent and um, really got into it. And then all of a sudden in uh, the la latter part of uh, the 70s, maybe early 80s, the book stopped being published in the United States. Oh. And uh, it, it was kind of a uh, kind of a drought, really, because all it was left at that time was uh, uh, the Hornblower series, and few people had ever heard of Patrick O'Brien at that point. Later on in that in that decade, I went to a local independent bookshop and uh, found uh, the first three uh, Aubrey novels in a book bin for remainders, wow. paperbacks. Wow! Wow! And well, and that's how I that's how I found uh, Patrick O'Brien. I'd never heard of him. But the covers had ships on them, you know the <laughs> uh, the, Je Whoa. the Jeff the Jeff Hunt paintings, and uh, um, that, that's how I initially got connected uh, with O'Brien. And then, at, to make a long story even longer, uh, my wife and I had uh, left uh, uh, the corporate world and moved to uh, rural Iowa, which which is uh, pretty far from the sea, and uh, I was missing books to read and i and at that time the internet in the, in the late uh, 90s was uh, just starting to pick up and i found a place online called tall ships books and it turned out that the uh, owner of tall ships books lived 35 miles from where we were and uh, so i initially placed an order for some alexander kent books with him online and then i thought well this is ridiculous he lives 35 miles away so uh, <laughs> I, I got in my car and drove over to Cedar Rapids, and the fellow's name was uh, Richard Merritt, and uh, he had uh, had the same issues that I had, uh, hadn't been able to find the book, so he went out and found a way to get them. And what he was doing in those days was, was pretty interesting. Uh, he didn't have a direct line to the U.K. to buy the books, but they were being sold in bookstores in Canada. And he found oh. a bookshop in Canada, and because of the exchange rates in those days, he could buy the books in Canada, have them shipped to himself, and then turn around and still make enough of a profit to make it a worthwhile effort. Then we ended up buying the shop. And we, at that time, he was basically selling the paperbacks uh, that he was getting from Canada. And it uh, wasn't too long after we took over that that, that uh, source kind of dried up. And uh, yeah. so we ended up uh, working directly with uh, uh, gardeners over in the UK uh, for distribution. And we changed the nature of the business to one that focused primarily on brand new hardcover first edition signed by the authors. Oh. And we started contacting each of the authors. In those days, it was like uh, uh, Douglas Raymond, who was, who was instrumental in helping us get our business going. And uh, Richard Woodman uh, was was just a, a, a real gentleman to help us out. And people like uh, Alexander Fullerton, who was a World War II vet in submarines uh, with the Royal Navy, and he was doing his, his books at that time. And uh, so readers really jumped on that whole thing. They were really interested in signed first edition hardcovers of all these uh, naval fiction authors. Well, and at that time, I was also hooked up with an outfit called McBooks Press. And uh, we actually kind of became friendly competitors at that time. I, I mean, he was selling the same kind of books that we were, but we really had a nice relationship, Alex and myself. And um, so that carried on into the uh, uh, early 2000s. And then all of a sudden, this this behemoth called Amazon came along, mm. um, made it really uh, uh, difficult to try to uh, uh, run the same kind of a business that we had been running for about seven years. And uh, at that time, we had a kind of an informal merger between Tall Ships Books and McBooks Press. Uh, we, we gave them uh, our inventory at that time. And in the process, I had been doing a publication called Quarter Deck, where I interviewed authors and uh, pretty much uh, promoted the uh, genre. And uh, when when we closed down Tall Ships, Alex <laughs> Scott asked me to continue to do the uh, publication. Oh. And uh, 
from there it kind of grew and uh, we had a really nice working relationship. Well, I might add a year ago along came a, a young lady by the name of uh, uh, Hurricane Stoner. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, it sounds so terrible that way. <laughs> she, Brittany blew in like a, like a fresh breeze and, uh, and has helped get us organized way beyond what we were able to do up until then. And uh, we've got a great working relationship. We also have a terrific uh, fellow by the name of Rick Reinhardt, who is the executive uh, editor of uh, Globe Pequot, and another young lady by the name of Justine. And we just have a terrific team uh, put together. And uh, it, it's just exciting as heck to see where McBooks Press now is going. Fantastic. One of the things we always love is, uh, you know, is seeing energetic, enthusiastic female faces in the nautical fiction genre. Brittany, can you tell us a little bit about your role at McBooks and and perhaps what first got you interested in the Patrick O'Brien books? Sure. So I am an acquisitions editor for McBooks, and then I also acquire history and nautical titles for Lions Press and Sheridan House, and they're two other imprints of Globe Pequot. Um, so my, my work life right now is very much maritime history and nautical fiction, and I love it. Mm. So my story starts, oh gosh, I saw a little film called Master and Commander back when it first came out on DVD. Cool. And in all honesty, after I finished watching it, I kind of said, what what was that? Um, because, you know, U.S. <laughs> history textbooks, they don't cover Napoleonic Wars very much at all. Um, so here is this film, you know, I... Had always been very drawn to history, but I really knew nothing about that particular time period. The characters were, to me, practically speaking, a different language with all the terminology. Um, so I was a little, you know, uncertain of kind of what to think of it, but the characters really drew me in. Um, so I ended up kind of falling down this deep dive of doing a lot of reading and really wanting to understand the movie and why everybody was so impressed with it. And I completely fell in love the more that I learned about the story and the background. So I, of course, discovered Patrick O'Brien. Um, I was reading a lot of nonfiction like Roy and Leslie Adkins yeah. um, and just really like deep diving into the subject. I live on the East Coast, um, so I ended up going to places like Hampton Roads Naval Museum. And of course, they had you know exhibits talking about the Shannon and the Chesapeake and the Java. And I was reading that at the time in Patrick O'Brien. I think it was Fortune of War. So, you know, suddenly history is kind of right in front of you. And um, that was also around the time the HMS Bounty Replica came up and did like an East Coast tour. So it was just very much, you know, suddenly in my world and I was pretty obsessed. Um, <laughs> so read, read lots of Patrick O'Brien, discovered Alexander Kent and just really fell in love. Um, and it, it really stuck with me, you know, all through college. I would just kind of go back to those books. Um, it always felt like coming home to old familiar friends. Right. And um, after college, I went to Operation Sail, which was down in Norfolk. And of course, they had international ships coming in from all over the world. And getting to watch that parade of sail, I just really said, like, I have to be involved in in this naval world in some form or another. So I always, you know, I've always kind of been looking for how how can it connect? How can I be working in this area? Started out in publishing and had a lot of different you know, roles. And then um, my former boss and mentor came to me and said, hey, you know, we we need an acquisitions editor for McBooks and somebody who likes nautical. And, you know, the answer, of course, was right away. Yes. <laughs> and it's just really been a dream come true. Fantastic. So tell us what then does an acquisitions editor do? We do a lot of reading, um, a lot of reading through manuscripts, you know, obviously taking things under consideration. Um, is the writing strong enough? We look a lot for not just, you know, the technical language and the historical background, but are you telling a good story? Are your characters yeah. engaging? Because at the end of the day, you know, readers want really strong, unique characters. And then, of course, we're also balancing a lot of the logistical questions like when, you know, how much time do we need to publish? Um, where are we going to print? What format is it going to be? There are a lot of interesting conversations that come up these days because over in the UK, um, your preferred format is what we call B format paperback. Yep. And that means that your trim size is actually a little bit smaller than what we generally would do a paperback format in for the US. Um, so, it, you know, Interesting little quirks like that where, you know, we're realizing our market is so spread between the UK and also here in the US. And how can we best accommodate that? Wow. And presumably there are English speaking audiences in other parts of the world as well, eh? 
Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We have an international division. Um, so they sell worldwide for us and they happen to be uh, very invested in nautical fiction as well. So it's a great, huh. great partnership. Oh, fantastic. So, Brittany, one of the things that we've ended up talking about on the show is that the, the diversity of this audience, this big kind of global audience for books like O'Brien's, for nautical fiction books. Who do you think they are these days? And, and where are they? And what do they seem to care about? Oh, such a good question. We we continue to see that really it is readers worldwide. So obviously there are a lot in the UK because of how rich and long the British naval history is. Um, but we also yeah. see a lot in the U.S. You know, for us, the U.S. Navy is is technically young, early. Um, we don't have quite as much history there. Yeah. So I think you know anybody who's interested in naval history, they might start out from the U.S. perspective, but then they want to get into you know some of that earlier time period when it was really the British and the French ruling the seas, essentially. Yeah. And, and the Spanish as well, to be fair, and the Portuguese. Oh, but, the Spanish are there too, yes. Yeah. <laughs> we, we lost the Portuguese somewhere. Right? <laughs> and I think too, you know, the, the Regency period, kind of that Georgian era, it tends to be pretty timeless, I think, on both sides of the Atlantic. Yeah. So I know, you know, from a U.S. perspective, I'm always really drawn in by that that aristocracy and some of those elements like that. So mm -hmm. when you have, you're you're almost lifting that whole social structure and putting it on a ship. Um, and that just to me is so fascinating and kind of that psychological aspect to one minute you've got the captain with his officers at an elaborate dinner, you know, tucked away in their cabins. And then the next day they're back to firing cannons at everybody. Um, so just kind of that contrast, you know, it keeps drawing in all different types of readers. Oh, it's fascinating. I mean, I wonder whether the success of a TV show like Bridgerton kind of echoes some of that interest as well. Oh, interesting. Even though um, many people will be very upset to hear me mention Bridgerton in the same breath as Patrick O'Brien, but you know, there's some of that, <laughs> some of that same fascination. Cool. And George, you, you've obviously been close to the audience as it's evolved since you first got involved. What have you noticed about who, who the audience is and maybe how that's changing? Well, surprisingly, one of the strongest audiences in uh, naval fiction. Uh, both uh, uh, in the 20th century stories about World War II as well as uh, uh, the Georgian era, is Germany. Huh. Uh, and they are a big market. And uh, at, at one point, Douglas Riemann slash Alexander Kent had his books published in 14 different countries at the same time. So it's a, it, is a, it is indeed a worldwide uh, phenomenon. Yeah. When we were still uh, uh, at the helm of Tall Ships Books, we had customers everywhere from Japan uh, in the Far East uh, all the way uh, in, into uh, uh, the European continent, uh, Scandinavia. We shipped everywhere. And, uh, you know, it, it's hard to say today. I think one of the real keys with the audiences right now are people's understanding of history. Yeah. You have younger generations right now who may or may not be getting the same sort of education and history that that the older generations did. And uh, without without some grounding in history, sometimes it's probably difficult to even relate to these uh, stories from the Georgian era. Um, right. It, it just it's just a fact. Twenty five years ago. When when uh, uh, McBooks was uh, uh, really starting to uh, at at its early peak, and Tall Ships Books was still involved, most of the readership was older. It was an older generation. I would in those days it would have been people in their sixties and seventies, uh, which which didn't rule out uh, younger people. But those those were the strongest uh, customers uh, that we saw. Right. And is, is that changing? I mean, you, you must be hoping that the, the demographic is that there are, there, are, there are new people joining that audience because otherwise, sooner or later, we're, we're, we're all going to turn our toes up. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, I, it's hard to tell today uh, just what the demographic is uh, of the readers. You know, there's online, you know, there's the, there's the Patrick O'Brien uh, Facebook page with, with uh, enthusiasts. And the same yeah. thing for uh, Dewey Lambden and some of the yeah. other authors. It's just difficult to know, you know, ages at that point. It, there's no yeah. doubt that there's still a, a broad interest in in all of these different authors. Uh, yeah, but it, it's just difficult to know 
you know, what their backgrounds are. Yeah, interesting. I haven't seen any marketing data that would tell us. It's interesting to see, too, there are a lot of um, different tall ship organizations or replica vessels that are starting to do more programs um, in line with like your STEM education and school programs. Right. So I think it's going to be interesting, too, to see how that might ripple. Yeah. Um, and kids are getting you know a lot more exposure yeah. to the tall ship world um, and what yeah. that brings about. Well, and eco powered, perhaps the resurgence of wind vessels as well. It will be fascinating to see. We're we're thrilled because, you know, one of our missions has been to try to bring more women to this series. And so, yeah. so Brittany, seeing somebody like you just you know, warms my heart. You know, we talked about differences in audiences. Uh, how about authors? You know, you've talked about so many different authors from this nautical fiction stable here. You know, what do they have in common? And, and what do you guys see sometimes as striking differences between them? Yeah, I think what jumps out at me the most is um, how authors are really working to set themselves apart from O'Brien yeah. and Kent and kind of that generation that came before. Um, so we are really lucky that we have a lot of authors who are really finding new angles or periods to focus on. Um, so, for instance, we have the Scottish author David Donaghy, and he writes the John Pierce adventures. Yeah. And when he started crafting his series, he took it um, pretty early back to the 1790s and the Mediterranean, and he stays very focused on that time period. Um, and that's not one that I've personally seen covered as much. Um, and he does his books. They're very episodic. The plot might take place over the span of just a few days or a couple weeks. Um, so he's actually on book 18 and just kind of crossing into the year 1797. And you get this, you know, get this really dialed in view of what's happening and kind of those highs and lows of the sailing life, you know, sometimes sometimes it's filled with a lot of action and other times you do have that interlude where they have to get from one place to another. Um, but it's very focused in on the Mediterranean and places like Corsica and Naples that I haven't seen covered as much um, in historical fiction. And then on the flip side, we have yeah. uh, Seth Hunter, who you've talked to before, and he took the more unique approach of making his character a spy on land as well as being in the Navy. Um, so right there, you've got a very versatile character. He's going to appeal to a lot of different types of readers. Um, he writes really good women characters, he so he draws in some readers there. Yeah. And he came to Trafalgar. I think George and I both kind of said, oh, how is he going to approach this? Because so many authors have done Trafalgar. And he found, you know, the really unique point of view without spoiling it too much that he's telling the story of what actually led to Trafalgar and a lot of events and nuances, you know, political nuances that not as many people are familiar with. Yeah. I'm not going to spoil too much here. But I, say, I, was, I really enjoyed the story of the Sicilian Sergeant of Marines yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that appears in the last few chapters there. I thought, oh, that's a really, really great lead in to that aspect of the story. It's a really, really well done. Yes. I, think, uh, I think a key... Uh, for what we would consider the uh, uh, A-level authors in the genre, uh, the, the top authors as far as readers are concerned, Alexander Kent, for example, or uh, Douglas Raymond, he was known and uh, th throughout his whole series for his sensitivity to the characters and the uh, extraordinary events he placed them in. His characters really were what, what drew in readers. It wasn't just Richard Blytho, you know, the captain. It was, uh, you know, like the uh, uh, the coxswain, uh, Stockdale, or uh, the other, what you would consider minor characters. And yet they were like, as, as Brittany said earlier, you open up a book and it's like old friends, you know, right. and all of a sudden you're, you're, right. you're with these old <laughs> friends. You know who their families are, you know, where they live, what you know, what they've been through in their lives. And, uh, you know, that kind of storytelling is what uh, has appealed to uh, readers, starting way back with Frederick Marriott, you know, back yeah. in the 1800s, uh, and, and Tobias Smollett, the, the first two authors uh, in the genre. And I guess one of the things that the immediately post-World War II generation had was some service experience of their own, which I think D Douglas Freeman did. Right. And C.S. Forrester didn't serve, but he spent time as a journalist aboard a ship in, the World War, in World War II. I, I guess the right. generation of writers writing now haven't got necessarily wartime Royal Navy experience, but there's plenty of seagoing experience, I guess, in the uh, uh, in, in that particular band of authors. You know, one one thing that these authors, all of them, uh, uh, Nicholas Montserrat, you know, who wrote The yeah. Cruel Sea, as he was shopping that book around London, 
he was being told that people didn't want to read anymore about war. And oh. uh, so in the years following the Second World War, there was a sense that that people just, you know, that wasn't something that appealed to people. And yet when, when Montserrat, that was just a huge bestseller when The Cruel Sea came out. And when Raymond started uh, in 1958 with uh, his uh, first book, A Prayer for the Ship, yeah. those books were bestsellers right off the bat. I mean, yeah. they those books were, were perpetually on the, you know, the Sunday Times uh, bestseller list. You don't see that anymore. Uh, it's it, and I'm I'm not sure why. Uh, yeah, newspapers aren't reviewing books like they used to. Those those mm. books were always reviewed. Yeah, and they were. That's no longer the case. There's obviously lots of supply because you have these great authors. There's obviously still some demand because you have customers buying the books, and you know also like getting into a a, a kind of like Patrick O'Brien and then reading back through all the rest of Alexander Ken, for example, and Julian Stockwin. What does it take to get those books in front of those readers? Like, to, to tell us what it takes to, to to bring a book to market. What might we be surprised to learn about how you get readers to pay attention to a new title? Well, it's, I guess, uh, the phrase is, it's complicated. Right. Uh, <laughs> in, to, in today's world, uh, it's important that the authors get involved in promoting their own books. That means doing signings, uh, giving talks, so that they they present themselves out there. Books just don't sell because you put a, a nice cover on it and put it out there. Right. Some people will buy books just by the cover, but you need to know a little bit about that author. And the most successful sales right now are from the authors who go out and sell themselves. Again, mm. I'm going to go back to I'm going to go back to Douglas Raymond. Back in the day, I mean, 1958, you got to understand, there was no internet. All you had were newspapers that would uh, periodically maybe do the reviews and there'd be some small advertising because publishers traditionally have not spent a lot of money on advertising unless it was a, a you know a celebrity or a big name that they had uh, automatic sales uh, that they could count on. But... Douglas Raymond went from one end of the United Kingdom to the to the other end of it, uh, and I'm talking about up in up into uh, uh, Scotland, all over all over England. Mm. He was invited, and he he would do it, and he would it, stick himself out there so people got to know that. And then he would go to Canada, he'd go to Toronto wow. as, as each new book came out, and he did a tour of the United States at one point. That is really the way books uh, uh, get sold uh, in in the real world right now. Wow. And, and it's funny, in the Patrick O'Brien fandom, lots of people are aware of and share photos online of those times in the kind of mid to late 90s when Patrick O'Brien traveled to the US and had a dinner aboard HMS Victory and was kind of being lionized. And it's easy to see those as a certainly deserved kind of look backwards, congratulations and sort of gratitude gesture from the market to Patrick for the books. But it's also clearly Patrick O'Brien and his publishers going, let's keep this moving. Let's keep the audience close to this author because that's how we get them to stay uh, stay, stay customers. One of the things we really try to do with our books is use classic art. Um, so either traditional painters who were painting you know, back in the 1800s or 1900s, and also a lot of original art by Jeffrey Huband. Um, and just things like that to you know make our make our covers stand out, draw in readers, um, and we try yeah. to keep them accurate. You know, if the book's about a brig, we try really hard to find a good painting of a brig to put on the front cover, um, and things like that. Nice. It gives us sort of a an advantage to put some of that older backlist back in front of a new audience by you know looking and saying, okay, let's let's do some Dudley Popes with new covers now because it has been a while and things have changed and reissue them. Another another thing in the in the on the sales side of things, a chain like uh, Barnes and Noble uh, used to buy their books nationally. In other words, somebody would buy the books for all the stores, right? And uh, they now have a an officer, and I'm not sure what his title is, but he, he used to work for Waterstones, I in my understanding, and uh, their whole their whole approach was to uh, let each store pick their own books and so what we've got right now in the united states instead of barnes and noble 
picking up, you know, the the latest, uh, say, Julian Stockwin or uh, any one of the other authors, uh, the stores do it. Well, if you don't have a buyer in a store who's interested in naval fiction, you're not going to have books on the table or on the shelves. And uh, the reality is my experience, when we've traveled the UK and going through the, uh, the train stations, the WH Smith's shops and that sort of thing, there was always great selections of books laid out there on the tables or on the shelves. And people pick it up and buy it when they're traveling by train or, you know, ri riding the bus. And that's why the B format that Brittany talked about is so important because it's a very uh, comfortable book to be able to carry a stick in your pocket or, uh -huh. you know, your briefcase. And you see people, you know, reading those books. But my experience was a lot of the books that I that I first came across, as I said, with Patrick O'Brien finding him in a, in a remainder bin, I, I my first book that I found of... Uh, uh, James L. Nelson was in a Barnes and Noble on the front table. It was a trade paperback, but it had a ship on it. And so I picked it up and I started to read it. And the next thing you know, you know, there's a series after that. I, we were still in the book business at that time. I contacted James Nelson. And what I did find out, this is interesting, I think. Most authors are thrilled to be able to talk about their books. And they're thrilled to be to be approached. There was only one who didn't. Yeah. And his <laughs> Patrick O'Brien. Right. As it right. is so well documented that uh that that wasn't something uh uh and and it didn't seem to affect his overall sales. But most of the other authors are very open and welcome uh uh being approached uh, to to share their story, to kind of give their their uh, history to us. Well, it's very much a community. You know, if you love tall ships, you're probably all in the same network, essentially. So, yeah, everybody's happy to chat about it. And and it's interesting to me. I mean, we've kind of approached it from different angles here. These communities and this kind of, you know, evangelism person to person, you know, how we can get involved with our local libraries buying, how we can get involved with that local bookstore, right. okay. how we can get involved. Because, you know, we, we made the, the reference to Bridgerton earlier you know, the thought that occurred in my mind at that moment was Downton Abbey at sea. And you see this groundswell of enthusiasm about periods, about, like you said, classes. We see O'Brien doing so much with this kind of hothouse there that I think that it, it's incumbent upon all of us who love this to kind of, you know, be evangelists a little bit and get the word out, and which is what we love, to, and to bring it to new audiences. I mean, you know, I often struggled with this idea about you know, exactly how some of these sales and all of that work and what this means. And Ian said, you know, so how much time did you stay up pondering about the warp drive on Star Trek? And I went, never. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know what that is. And he said, you don't hear either. I was like, done. Uh -huh. I'm there because I, I am back with my family here and I'm back with this adventure. Or like you were saying, Brittany, I'm back with these fascinating characters in different domains, but also handling universal things about feelings and emotions and people and things. So, you know, just so much to mine here. Nothing that a, a great Netflix or Amazon or uh, HBO series wouldn't do magnificent wonders for. And we'll all keep our fingers crossed for that. Let me just ask, you know, what's next for MacBooks? What should we be on the lookout for? What's going on there with you guys? So, yeah, coming up, we have Droits of the Crown, which is the 18th book in the John Pierce series by David Donaghy. Um, so that'll be coming out this fall. Uh, we have Seth Hunter hard at work on book number nine in the Nathan Peak series, um, titled To Be Determined. But yeah, coming down the pipeline for probably early next year. Um, and then, you know, we've also alluded to that we do like to go back and do reissues of some of the, the nautical classics, so to speak. Um, so we're looking at doing some new editions of um, authors like Frederick Marriott, C. Northcote Parkinson, and Dudley Pope. Um, so it means George and I will be hunting for cover art, which is probably one of the best parts of our job, getting to look at pictures of ships and <laughs> all of that. Excellent. George, you mentioned Quarterdeck a couple of times, and the Quarterdeck is still here. I, I think a lot of our listeners would be interested in that. Can you tell us a little bit more about Quarterdeck and how to find you guys on social media, if you will, and McBooks? Quarterdeck, uh, it's a publication that runs around 30-some pages uh, uh, quarterly. And uh, 
we try to we try to uh, have at least one interview in there with a with a new author or a refreshed interview with uh, uh, an established author that we've done maybe uh, years earlier. Uh, we do this. We also cover uh, maritime art with the various artists. You know, we try to we try to uh, alert people with with each issue to the books that will be coming out. Not just from McBooks Press, but from the publishers in general. Nice in the genre for the next year. And book reviews of you know not just from us, but from other publishers. You know, maritime right. nonfiction as well. Outstanding. Yeah. And um, if 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 people are interested in uh, uh, subscribing to it, it uh, there's no cost. They should just go to the McBooks Press uh, uh, website and. Uh, uh, look under newsletter and there's a way there's a way to uh, uh, just put your email in there and it'll be sent to you uh, automatically on a quarterly basis. com slash newsletter. And we also, you can find us on Facebook. We have pages for both Quarter Deck and for McBooks Press. Um, and George and I are always on there posting about artwork or, you know, interesting articles that have come out. So definitely stop by there and chat with us, all things naval fiction and naval history. Brittany and George, thank you both so much for coming on the show. It's been really great to have you here with us on The Lover's Hole. It's been really great to hear about this whole nautical fiction genre. And I think it's going to help our listeners as well to think about where else they might go to satisfy their nautical fiction craving besides the fantastic canon of Patrick O'Brien. So thank you once again. Look forward to talking to you again in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Great. So, Mike, loads of fun having that conversation with Brittany and George. Uh, we hope we get to talk to them again. Our thanks to them for coming and joining us on the show. We could have talked for hours, and you might even say that we almost did. There's certainly plenty in the extended edit that is going to be available for all of our Patreon supporters. And if you're interested in becoming a Patreon supporter, you can go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hole, where there are extended interview edits and notes and media from the show, all sorts of stuff to get interested in there. But Mike, let's get back into the chapter for a second. Like we said, very short chapter, but very significant for the story. Yeah. Yeah. And it's fascinating. O'Brien, in this book, I think, from what I remember, more than any other seems to interweave these short and long chapters here. But it's like you said, it's an excellent one. We've talked so much about how he shows us friends helping one another in very tactful ways and, and in ways that are far more likely to be helpful and far less likely to take a toll on the friendship, which was, I think, brilliantly sussed out there at the end. You know, Jack, if you mm. had told me that, oh, you would have held it against me here. So, And O'Brien so beautifully highlights how so many times the problems that we have are really a result of the stories that we tell ourselves, like those yeah. that Sophie and Jack are telling themselves here. And, you know, the potentially devastating effects of those on the ones we love, on our romantic relationships, on our friendships, as we were just talking about, yeah. and the damaging effects to our own self-interest. So great writing, great character development, great insights, great advice for us, O'Brien, in your examples. <sighs> and, you know, so much of that great, great, great way of doing all these things that O'Brien does that we love. Yeah, absolutely. And Mike, in, in a few short paragraphs, we packed in so much of a journey and of learning and of development for the characters and Jack in particular, we've still got a lot of story to come back to. We've got Thomas and Duff. We've got trouble in the squadron, perhaps trouble aboard the flagship. Certainly we've got a, a very sick, a gravely sick first lieutenant. Hopefully some of this mitigated now by Jack's insights into the situation and the news about Parson Hinksy. Can Jack throw himself on Sophie's mercy and get back to forming a happy ship and an effective squadron. We're headed off to Africa and hopefully we'll get there quicker than we ever made it to South America, which took several books long. Right. What kind of encounters are we going to have with slavers here? Yeah. And and what about this whole mission to stop the French from taking Ireland? I mean, we got right. that set up. Stephen, we haven't heard anything about it from Jack yet. I'd like to hear a lot more about that too. Me too, Mike. I, I think the only thing for it is to uh, to reach down the book once more from the shelf. What do you say next week to just a little bit more Patrick O'Brien? Mm, I should love that of all things. <laughs>
I know what the problem is. I was on mute. Oh, there we go. Brilliant. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we, sh- we should have one of those one of these days in and out. <laughs> Love that. Well, 90 seconds of silence. Here we go.